Welcome to this video, introducing the 13 tribes of the Garu from the tabletop role-playing game Werewolf the Apocalypse. Once upon a time, before the Impergium, the Garu were a single tribe, but as the Impergium progressed, humans spread throughout the world and some of the Garu pledged themselves to powerful spirits that became their tribal totems, granting them gifts and imposing bans on them. These are the tribes that remain in the modern world, the first and last line in the coming apocalypse. But without further ado, the 13 tribes. The Black Furies. The Black Furies are a tribe composed almost entirely of female Garu. The tribe originated in Greece and remains heavily influenced by ancient Greek ideas of nature, war, and mysticism. Indeed, the Furies claim that their creation was the result of Artemis, goddess of animals, vegetation, hunting, chastity, childbirth, and an aspect of Luna, created the tribe from seven she-wolves, then charged them to protect the wild and women from the predations of men, both in general and as a sex. Even their view of the cosmos has a decidedly Greek bent, naming the triad as the Mori, or the Fates. Clotho, the spinner, is the wild which spins threads of possibility into life. Lachesis, the allotter, is the weaver, giving each thread its boundaries or limits, weaving the threads into the whole of the tapestry. And last, but not least, is Atropos, the unturnable, the worm, who severs the thread at its appointed time. The Furies have inspired and benefited from tales of vengeful female spirits and warrior women, such as the Maenads, the Amazons, and the Valkyries. Indeed, they take their duty as punishers of men very seriously and practice the arts of war with as much enthusiasm as they do the rights of Gaia, so that they can defend the security of their cairns and bonds and keep them spiritually pure. The Furies have a bit of a complicated relationship with men. Other tribes write them off as deranged man-haters and child killers. While there are black Furies who despise the entirety of the male sex, more simply chauvinistic, owing to what they believe is a deeper connection to Luna and Gaia through the feminine nature of both goddesses, one that males can never comprehend. Other Black Furies not only don't hate men, but find them quite pleasing both in form and function. Finally, the totem of the Black Furies tribe, Pegasus, who was gelded by the hand of Bellerophon, will not tolerate any male within the tribe with one exception, the Metis, who like Pegasus, are sterile. And this gave rise to another issue. Contrary to gossip, the Black Furies do not breed females exclusively. On occasions when a Black Fury or kin gave birth to a male Garu, the ancient custom of the tribe was to sacrifice the child to Gaia, in the hopes that its soul would be reincarnated as a female. With the passage of time and the urging of the children of Gaia, this bloody practice was abandoned in favor of giving up their male cubs to other tribes, particularly the children of Gaia and the Silent Striders with the understanding that if the male bloodline ever produced any female Garu, that they would be encouraged to return to the Black Furies. Likewise, female Garu who find the tribes of their birth not to their liking have been known to find a home among the Black Furies. The Bone Nars. Other Garu dismiss the Bone Nars as the lowest element of their kind, wolves who do not hunt in the wilderness but subsist on the castoffs of humans. However, the Bone Nars are survivors without equal. From the scraps and leavings of humanity, the Bone Nars have grown alongside humanity into the most numerous tribe of the Garu Nation. The Bone Nars are less likely than their cousins to stand on ceremony, or even adhere too strictly to Garu customs, though they have customs of their own. The Bone Nars may be poor, but they live freely. Their leaders rise to respect based on deeds and ability, rather than breeding and ancestry. They take as much as they need and distribute the excess among their pack and sept. This extends to those under their protection, those who are considered useless to human society, the beggars, the indigent, the runaways, the addicts, the prostitutes, and the hustlers. Every half-eaten sandwich or half-finished bottle of booze, or a dirty $5 bill to buy a meal, is another set of eyes and ears the bone gnars can utilize against the worm in the cities. The Bonars don't share the other tribe's proclivity for a glorious open warfare, but they are deadly masters of urban guerrilla warfare, 
and enemies who cross their territory unaware are usually never seen again. The Children of Gaia The Children of Gaia were born of the Impergium, and their first great act was to bring about its end, a deed which some tribes have never forgiven them for. Yet the children believe that life is a gift from Gaia, to be protected whenever possible, and only taken when no better alternative is possible. They are the champions of Gaia's peace, who seek to unify their kind, even if they have to drag the rest of them kicking and screaming along to do it. Though the Garu are creatures of war, the children of Gaia believe that bloodshed for the sake of aggression, vengeance, and vanity opens the souls of the Garu to the malice of the worm. The Imperdrum created a rift of malice and fear between the Garu and humans that is never healed, and which the Gaians argue would have been made worse had it not ended when it did. Despite their reputation as Pollyannish peaceniks, the wise respect the Gaians as peacemakers and, when necessary, peacekeepers. The Gaians have worked, with great difficulty, to bring enlightenment to the Garu and humans alike, with mixed results. The Fianna The Fianna are masters of the spoken and written word, bards and lore keepers of the Garu nation. Originating from the Celts of Gaul and Britannia, the Fianna keep the history of their tribe and race with the same enthusiasm with which they wage war as has been learned by the notoriously martial Geta Fenris, who have invaded the Isles several times. The Fianna have strong relations with their kinfolk. They even named the Fae, as well as a cult of mages called the Verbena, as allies. Yet they are famous for their poor treatment of the tribe's metis, even as they seem to produce more of them than any other tribe. In general, the Fianna are noted to be a lusty people, whether it is a love of songs, stories, contest of wit, wordplay, riddles, or arms. One of the most popular topics of Fianna songwriters is the tragedies that often accompany Fianna romances. The Fianna once ranged across Europe before following their tribal totem, Stag, to England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. They fought beside the ancestors of the Changelings, the Tuatha de Danann, against their enemies, the Fomorians. They shared land with one of the lost tribes of the Garu, the White Howlers, who fell to despair, madness, and finally, the worm. They followed their kinfolk across the world to North America and Australia, and came into conflict with the native Garo of those lands. In the latter half of the 20th century, the Fianna experienced a minor civil war within the tribe between Garu who aligned themselves with the nationalist interest of Ireland and those who were loyal to Britain. This conflict took place during the Troubles until 1998. Currently, the Fianna are navigating the country's economic revival, thanks in part to the European Union. Unfortunately, all that new money has led to new development, which encroaches on the Fianna's ancestral septs. This in turn has resulted in a quandary for the Fianna, who now must consider how to fight the weaver, where once they focused solely on the worm. The Get of Fenris The Get of Fenris are ferocious, bloodthirsty, and violent, even by Garu standards. These wolves of Nordic stock are almost always eager for a fight, whether it is against each other or the other tribes. The tribe's honor is built on their devotion to strength and their willingness to sacrifice themselves for the good of Gaia. The Ged believe that only the strongest warriors are fit to fight on Gaia's behalf, and they become fit by testing themselves against anyone and anything they deem worthy of challenge. Those who are weak do not deserve to keep what they have, not even their own lives. The Gets sing of heroes who died gloriously in battle, of powerful foes slain, and of the honor they might win in death. They are the vanguard of Gaia's warriors of the apocalypse, as none are worthy to stand beside them at the front of the final battle. Their attitudes and their history do not endear them to the other tribes. The Gets' militarism and belief in the moral superiority of strength has resulted in battles over cairns and fetishes that might have otherwise been avoided by negotiation. But then again, that which is not gained by strength is of little value to the get. The Glass Walkers Generally the Garu are creatures of wild places, the forest and glens, and regard cities and even towns as blights on Gaia, and havens of the weaver and worm. 
The glass walkers call these nests of glass and steel their hunting grounds. The glass walkers have always dwelled in humanity's shadow since the ancient city-states of Mesopotamia, and, above all other Garu, respect humanity's ingenuity for good and ill. The glass walkers have gone through many names in the history of the tribe, a tendency that marks their adaptability and ability to adopt new ideas and technology in service to Gaia. But their fascination with human toys has caused them to be distrusted by their fellows. For their part, the glass walkers regard the other Garu, with the exception of the bone gnawers, as rustics and bumpkins who pine for a world that has been lost to them and can never return. While they are in the cities, they can hunt down and slay the most vile servants of the worm, who rarely bother to venture out into the forest for the Garu to kill. These rationales, already far too human for the tastes of some Garu, tend to fall on deaf ears, but the glass walkers' possession of several powerful urban cairns and alliances with previously unknown elementals of steel and glass is sufficient proof, if only to themselves, that their way is favored by Gaia. While they do not wield the considerable influence of the vampires, the glass walkers are well connected enough to learn of and halt developments that threaten the other Garu. One of the reasons that the glass walkers haven't been denounced as traitors, at least not yet. The Red Talons The Red Talons are unique, though some might call them an oddity. They are a tribe composed entirely of lupus Garu. They have no human kinfolk, they do not breed with humans, and most refuse to even change into a homid form. In the days of the Impergium, the Red Talons were one of the mightiest of all of the tribes. But the growth of humanity, the loss of their homelands and their lupus kinfolk has severely weakened them nearly to the point of extinction. This has led the Red Talons to a single savage conclusion. It will not be enough to bring humanity down to acceptable numbers as in the days of the Impergium. The solution is the complete extermination of the human race. And this extreme view does not endear them to their fellow Garu, even those who secretly desire to restore the Impergium in some form. The Red Talons even regard Hamid-born Garu as unworthy of their respect. Predictably, the Red Talons stay far away from cities as they can, in wild places where even other Garu fear to walk, and possess ancient, secret rites long thought to have been lost to time. The Shadow Lords Few tribes are quite as practiced in the less savory aspects of political intrigue, warfare, and politics as the Shadow Lords. They are praised as heroes and reviled as villains, occasionally for the same acts. They crave glory and honor like any Garu, but are perfectly willing to cast them aside to do what must be done for the good of the tribe and their people. The Shadow Lords came to prominence in the Balkans, where they lived and died by a simple creed, the weak must serve the strong. The Garu are more powerful than humans, therefore it is only right that the Garu should rule over them. Likewise, the Shadow Lords are supreme among the Garu, therefore it is only right that the Lords should rule the Garu. There is perhaps no other tribe that is as singly and collectively powerful as the Shadow Lords, thanks to their personal development and their unity against their enemies. The only tribe that rivals them is the Silver Fangs. Once the Shadow Lords thought it appropriate to submit to these Wolf Kings, but their weakness and infirmity has given the Shadow Lords the proof that as the apocalypse approaches, a firmer and more ruthless hand is necessary if the Garu are to win the final battle. The Silent Striders The Silent Striders are well-known travelers and messengers, though not entirely by their own choice. Hailing from the harsh lands of the Sahara and the fertile Nile River Valley, few know of the painful and tragic history of the tribe that cost them both their homeland and their ancestors. The Silent Striders wander the world, hanging on the edges of Garu society, rarely joining packs, treating with spirits, elementals, ghosts, and even mages. They collect a great deal of information, some of which they deliver to their fellow Garu, information which has saved many lives and septs. Yet the Silent Striders are regarded as too secretive in their ways, as bearers of misfortune rather than welcome heralds. But the Silent Striders bear their own collective misfortune, as their name suggests, in silence. A mighty beast of the worm cast his curse upon the tribe, 
severing them from their homelands, their cairns, and their ancestors. This godlike creature, named Set, is the reason that the Striders hate vampires with a fury that would even put the Red Talons and Shadow Lords to shame. The Silent Striders prize knowledge and wisdom over fury. Despite their dour demeanors, the Striders are master storytellers and have even enthralled the Fianna with their tales of strange lands and spirits, of mighty battles and cunning heroes. The Silver Fangs Before the tribes, before the Impergium, there was only one pack, the Silver Fangs, the sons and daughters of the progenitor wolf. Only the Silver Fangs have kept their blood pure and united the fractured tribes under their leadership. But the nobility of the Silver Fangs, first among the tribes, has weakened and waned with the passage of time and by inbreeding, both on the wolf and the human sides. The Silver Fangs trace their lineage to the heroes and nobles of Russia. They have the beauty and bearing of their valiant forebearers, yet there are deformities in the minds of the tribe's members. These appear as eccentricities at the best of times, and outright madness and psychosis among the worst sufferers. The Silver Fangs do their best to conceal their weakness and embody the values of the tribe. They were born to rule, and attempt to rule well, with wisdom and strength. And in battle, the Silver Fangs are terrible to behold, peerless warriors and leaders. Yet, the Silver Fangs are beset by not only the forces of the worm, but their own allies. The Get of Fenris and the Red Talon smell weakness in them, believe that they are no longer worthy to rule, mock and disrespect them openly. The Shadow Lords believe much the same, though they prepare for the day when the Silver Fangs topple over on their own weak legs. The Silver Fangs set a great deal of stock in elaborate ceremony and pageantry, a mixture of the customs and graces of human royal courts and their own ancient rituals. There is a younger generation of Silver Fangs who are, individually, seeking to undo the rot that is eaten away at the foundations of the tribe. However, it may be too little and too late. The Stargazers The Stargazers are mediators and meditators, ponderers of riddles, bearers and seekers of truth. But what is truth? Gaia is truth, and her truth may only be discerned by a wise and harmonious soul. The Stargazers have greater mastery of their rage than any other tribe, but they are also the most isolated of them all. Appropriately and unfortunately, they are fewer in number than any other tribe, and less than 500 Stargazer Garu exist in the entire world, and most of these converts from other tribes. They are more enlightened than their fellow Garu, but in their solitude have cast aside the strength of the pack. Any association with a Stargazer is temporary, whether it is a matter of hours or a matter of years. This has cost them something of their wolf selves, but the Stargazers see much of what their fellow Garu do as illusions and traps created by the true enemy to ensnare their souls. That enemy is the Weaver. As such, the Stargazers see cities as places to be best avoided. They also hold the Bone Nars and Glass Walkers at arm's length under the best of circumstances for their association with the Binder of all things. The Stargazers' diminished numbers led to the fall of their most valuable cairn in Tibet and a monumental decision that rocked the Garu Nation. In 2000, the Stargazers accepted an invitation from the Hange Yokai to join the beast courts of the Emerald Mother in Asia and abandon the Western Concordiat. In a rare moment of collective wisdom, the other Garu permitted them to leave in peace so that they could reclaim their lost cairns, rebuild their strength, and continue to walk the middle path. An important part of the Stargazer's mental and physical discipline is the practice of Kai Lindo, a martial art that combines their rare use of rage with the fluidity of shapeshifting into a uniquely powerful fighting style. Some Garu who are aware of Kailindo have challenged the Stargazers to test their art. While they do not seek out warfare, the Stargazers understand that it is an unavoidable part of the world. Those enemies who may be spared, Kailindo offers avenues to disable an enemy without harming him. Those who are engulfed in the evils of the Weaver or the Worm, their deaths may be swift, though not entirely painless. The Uctena the path that the Uctena walk is a dark one. They are the keepers of rites and lore that hold powerful worm spirits at bay, as well as knowledge gained from other shapeshifters, won by challenge or as gifts for deeds done. But the Uctena hold their secrets close to them, 
making other Garu, even their own brother tribe, the Wendigo, wary of them, and of the dark hunger for knowledge that lurks behind their old eyes. The Uctena are one of the three tribes of Garu that crossed into the Americas, at the time only one tribe, following their kinfolk south until they came to a stop in what is today the American Southwest. They purified the land of Banes and other worm spirits, and bound them in slumber beneath the earth. They shared vision fruit with the Coyote Men and the Raven Men. For their knowledge and wisdom, the other pure ones named them Elder Brother. Their totem, the River Serpent Utena, taught them to hunger for lore as he did, and to keep those secrets close to their hearts, as he keeps his own. For generations, Utena shaman known as Bane Tenders kept the most powerful of the worm servants bound in slumber beneath the earth. In fact, no tribe is better at sniffing out the worm than the Utena, a fact that has disquieted even their brothers. When the Garu of Europe, called the Wormbringers by the Utena and the Wendigo, crossed the ocean, the Utena struck the chains from those they held in servitude, gave them refuge, and exchanged secrets with them. The Wormbringers attacked the Utena and stole their cairns, making them more insular and many withdrew into the Umbra in search of solace and answers as to how to restore the land. Today, the Uctena are a contradiction in terms. Their encyclopedic knowledge of spirits and the spirit world is kept closely guarded against outsiders. Those who are dispossessed may find themselves welcome among the tribe, but every Uctena is tempted by the forbidden knowledge that is their birthright. They will cooperate with other Garu, reluctantly, but ultimately, they are bound by duty to protect their kin, and more importantly, the knowledge that only they, who have mastered their inner darkness, can keep safe. The Wendigo The Wendigo are the third of the three Native American tribes known as the Pure Ones. Their anger is as cold and merciless as the boreal forests and tundras they call home. But second in their hearts only to rage is grief. For they have grieved the fall of the Croatan for generations, and fought against the Wormcomers and Wormbringers. But their kin, mortal and wolf, have been hunted down in reprisal. Even their elder brother, the Uctena, have polluted their blood by breeding with the Wormcomers. For three centuries, the Wendigo have vented their fury against everyone, human and Garu, as the last true defenders of the Pure Ones. The tribe's name is derived from their totem, the cannibal spirit of winter, though he was not always so. Wendigo learned strength, ferocity, honor, and relentlessness which he taught to his tribe. He permits no prey to escape, no matter how far or fast they run. Likewise, the Wendigo tribe are dauntless, waging a ceaseless guerrilla war against all who seek to pollute their land, their kin, or their blood. Unfortunately, the Wendigo include every other Garu in that category as thieves, defilers of the pure lands, whose spirits are so tainted by the worm that they corrupt the world unwittingly. This leads to a great deal of tension with the other tribes. Even when they ally with the other Garu, it is with clenched teeth and as brief as possible. The Black Furies, the Red Talons, and the Silent Striders have earned their grudging respect. They understand what it means to see one's lands and people stolen, corrupted, or both. The Wendigo's ire is especially focused on the Fianna, the Geta Fenris, and the Shadow Lords who are the most enthusiastic thieves of Croatan and Wendigo Cairns. Only the Uctena are permitted to attend Wendigo Moots, as they are still kin, but the sight of the Elder Brother pains the Wendigo, as they have fallen low from what they once were. The Wendigo have all the ferocity and pride of a dying people, who will not go quietly to their final destruction. In the frozen north, the line is drawn. They will fight for the pure lands, even if that means killing every last worm bringer on the continent. Officially, the Wendigo only breed with people of Native American descent and the timber wolves. Even as they wage a guerrilla war against the forces of the weaver and the worm, they also defend the old ways of their people and seek to transmit them to the young with the sense to listen. Apart from war, certain theurges of the tribe walk the spirit world in search of the souls of the lost Croatan and their tribal totem, Turtle. And those were the 13 existing tribes of the Garu. At the height of the werewolf strength, there were 16 tribes, but three of those have fallen. The White Howlers fell prey to their own despair and hubris, becoming slaves of the Worm of Corruption. The Croatans sacrificed themselves to save the world from the Worm. 
and the Bunyip were wiped out thanks to the treachery of the worm and the arrogance of their fellow Garu. Werewolves are alternately tragic, heroic, and infuriatingly foolish. The most noble of their kind struggle not only against forces that are beyond the scope of mortal minds, but against the short-sightedness of their own kind, with time running against them. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Until next time.